So welcome everybody. Morning, Nevada. Hi, William. So we are slowly admitting everybody from the waiting room, uh, participants and judges who are going to observe the match. Um, I want to welcome you all to the 14th edition of the Prize Media Law Moot Court and the finals. Uh, the second finals online, unfortunately, but we also hope it's the last final that we will held online. Uh, we will not know that until next year, but uh, we are happy to have you all here. We are also we also want to congratulate teams 104 and 205 for making it to the finals, and we want to especially thanks our final band judge. Judges Mark Stevens, uh, Nani Jensen Reventlov, and Gehan Gunatileke for being here with us today. Uh, I won't keep it much longer. You've heard a lot from me and my colleague Sarah in the last couple of days. And um, I would ask the bailiff to start this match. Good luck to everybody. The Universal Freedom of Expression Court is now in session. Honourable Judges Gehan D. Gunatileke, Mark Stevens, and Nani Jensen Reventlov presiding with Judge Gehan D. Gunatileke as President of the Court. The current matter before the Court is the case between ZANA and the Social Democratic Workers' Union as applicants against the state of IZ as respondent. Each side has 30 minutes to present their case and first counsel for the applicants is requested to please come forward. Your Excellencies, before I begin with my submission, I would just like to confirm that I am both audible and visible to the bench. Yes, you are. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening, Your Excellencies, wherever you may be joining us from. May it please this court, my name is Aman Sardiwala, and together with my co-counsel, Mr. Sumit Chatterjee, we act for the applicants, the Social Democratic Workers' Union, and Ms. Josana. For the first 15 minutes, I will address this court on issues A and B pertaining to the restriction on physical assemblies under Section 22 of the NSA and Zana's conviction there under respectively. For the next 15 minutes, my co-counsel will address this court on issues C and D. We respectfully reserve three minutes for rebuttals. Your Excellencies, this dispute is one where the respondent has infringed upon the applicant's rights to freedom of expression and assembly by using the guise of a public health crisis to crush political opposition and silence criticism of the government. I submit that IZID violated the applicant's rights under Articles 19 and 21 of the ICCPR by first, enacting Section 22 of the NSA and designating the Central Public Park as the sole public site for assemblies, and second, convicting ZANA under Section 22 of the NSA. Proceeding first with my submissions on issue A. IZID enacted section 22 of the NSA, authorizing its Minister of Defense to designate public sites that may be used for gatherings during emergencies. In light of the NIDV emergency, IZID designated the Central Public Park as the only public site for assemblies in the entire country. While Absolutely. the freedom of um, are you saying that the very act of enacting a law, uh, giving those powers to the government, is in itself a violation of uh, the, the relevant articles of the ICCPR? Your Excellencies, our submission today is that the way that the legislation is drafted is imprecise and therefore does not grant sufficient precision and is not reasonably foreseeable to the citizens of ICID and therefore is violative of the rights under the ICCPR. And Could you elaborate on the point? Yeah, go ahead. And what is the framework against which you think we should be judging this? Is it uh, the independence and rights of uh, a nation state to create its own laws? Or do you say that there is some 
international instrument which takes precedence and should govern this? Uh, Your Excellencies, our submission is that every law which is enacted by the state and the application of the law is one which must meet the three-part test which is laid out within the text of the ICCPR. And our submission today is that IZIT failed to meet this threshold. And to that, I make three submissions. First, that section 22 was not provided by law. Second, that the designation of a single site was not necessary. And third, that the designation of a single site was not proportionate. Since the three-part test is a conjunctive test, if this court accepts any one of my submissions today, then a violation of the applicant's rights would be established. But also, moving just to interrupt you, uh, doesn't this law uh, envisage a public health emergency? And couldn't a state uh, authorize itself to take certain actions in the context of a public health emergency? Your Excellency, we make two submissions to that point. First, that Section 22 is not a legislation which is specific to the NIDV crisis, but was enacted as a general emergency provision. Second, we submit that although states are free to enact legislations, they must still meet the requirement of the three-part test and that of legality therein. And if, my, if I may make my submissions on why the legislation was not provided by law, Your Excellency. Go ahead, yeah. The European Court of Human Rights in its 1991 decision of Ezelin versus France held that for a legislation to be provided by law, it must be sufficiently precise so as to enable individuals to reasonably foresee if they would be liable under the same. In this case, if I may invite this court's attention to page three of the record at paragraph 14. If, if your excellencies are with me, and if I may read out the relevant part for the court, which is the second line of section 22 clause one, it states, and I quote, no person shall conduct or facilitate the conducting of any gathering, unquote. The phrase facilitate the gathering of is extremely vague and is not sufficiently precise for a rights bearer to know if they would be liable under this section. The threshold of what qualifies as facilitate the conducting of is ill-defined in, uh, in general jurisprudence and in section 22 itself. But counsel... Simply just to just to interrupt again, uh, is are any of the applicants accused of facilitating the conduct of uh, a public gathering, or are they accused of uh, publicly gathering? Your Excellencies, I recognize your concern that, uh, uh, but to that I have two submissions. First, we submit that Zana did not conduct the gathering in the first place, and therefore her accusation would fall under facilitation of the gathering because. Zana was merely a leader of the union. However, it was the union which had called for the assembly in the first place. But second, as was observed in the general comment number 37 itself, that uh, for, for a legislation to be provided by law, it must be reasonably foreseeable to members of the society. Therefore, we submit that as enacted itself by using vague, uh, vague phrases like facilitate the gathering of, which are not defined, and therefore a person would not know whether they're liable under the same, the legality limb is not met by the respondents in this case. Could you just clarify for me for a moment, like how you distinguish uh, the union as an entity from its leader? Because that seems like a, a rather artificial uh, distinction. Your Excellencies, our submission is that Izana was a leader of the union, and we submit that when there are organizations like the union which exist, there are multiple leaders. However, to hold each leader accountable for an act done by the organization itself is something which we submit cannot be done. Therefore, our submission is that Zana was in fact a facilitator. However, even if your excellencies are not with me on that point, I will still demonstrate to this court that the applicant's rights, irrespective of whether Zana conducted or facilitated the assembly would be violated. If I may proceed your excellencies to my submission that the restrictions were not necessary. Even during a epidemic, 
rights cannot be restricted indiscriminately when they are not strictly required by the exigencies of the public health crisis. Even if we accept the respondents' claim on face value that NIDV is indeed vector borne, there was still no pressing social need to designate one site only for public assemblies. Well, can I ask you, um, obviously governments have limited resources, particularly during the time of a pandemic. Um, so if the government took the view that this was uh, the only way they could do it with the resources they had at hand, uh, what margin of appreciation do you say we should give to them? Your Excellencies, the margin of appreciation is one which has been explicitly rejected within ICCPR jurisprudence by the case of Ilmari Landsman versus Finland. Therefore, and the reason for the court in that case was that universal rights are something which should have a minimum common threshold. And therefore, by granting this margin of uh, appreciation to states, it would lead to a paradigm where states could go about indiscriminately uh, restricting rights, which would go ahead and erode the very human rights which are enshrined in the ICCPR. Uh, Therefore, we submit. Proceed with that point, Council. Uh, are you saying that this court is bound by the decisions of a human rights treaty body? Um, are we not able to proceed uh, with the doctrine of margin of appreciation, given the fact that there are many uh, jurisdictions that have uh, recognized that doctrine? Yes, Your Excellencies, we recognize that this court is not bound by the decisions of the Human Rights Committee. However, we submit that the reasoning adopted by the Human Rights Committee is one which is a persuasive value before this court, and therefore we submit that the margin of appreciation doctrine is one which should be rejected by this court. But assume for a moment against your argument, uh, which I understand, uh, that I do feel that I need to grant uh, the margin of appreciation to the state, how do you say I should judge that? Your Excellencies, even if the respondents were to have been accorded a margin of, uh, a margin of appreciation, our submission is that the restrictions must still comply with the three-part test, which has been laid down by the ICCPR, and simply having a margin of appreciation is not a guise for them to then act in a manner which is contrary with the three-part test within the, IPR, uh, within the ICCPR. If I may proceed to my submissions on how the restrictions were neither necessary nor proportionate, even if the states had a margin of discretion, we submit at the outset that NIDV is a vector-borne disease, even, on, even if we take the respondent's claim on face value, and therefore is one which is based on exposure to mosquitoes as opposed to a virus like COVID-19, whose transmission depends on exposure to people. The World Health Organization guidelines on vector-borne diseases have focused on controlling the spread of the disease at the vector itself, such as uh, with measures such as improving sanitation to reduce breeding of mosquitoes. By contrast, only rec recommendations for airborne or human contact spreading diseases like COVID-19 have focused on the restriction of individual rights when they ask the individual not to step out unless necessary. Seeing as NIDV is at best mosquito-borne, there was no pressing social need for the state to restrict assemblies by designating one site only. Moving then to my submission on the proportionality of the measure, we submit that by designating only one site for public assemblies in an entire country with a population of more than 20 million people, the respondents have acted in a way which was disproportionate. It is the burden on the respondent to adopt the least restrictive measures and even if a single less restrictive measure exists, these restrictions would be considered to be disproportionate. And what would that be, uh, in your opinion, Council? Uh, yes, Your Excellency. We submit that the respondent could have adopted multiple such less restrictive measures, such as designating more sites which would be proportionate to the population of the country by asking organizers to self-fumigate a site of their choice if they believe they do not have the resources to fumigate uh, sites for protest, or even call for the use of mosquito repellents and full clothing, as was recommended in the World Health Organization guidelines for Zika virus, which is another mosquito-borne disease. Seeing that the respondent has not done so, we submit that their measures are disproportionate, and therefore, the applicant's rights have been violated under Articles 19 and 21 on Issue A. 
if i may then move to my submissions on issue b pertaining to zana's conviction at the outset we submit that zana was convicted under section 22 of the nsa which only criminalizes assembly at non designated sites despite this to justify her sentence the respondents in their written submissions have heavily relied on the fact that zana encouraged protesters to block the entrance of the hospital something which at the outset falls outside the scope of section 22 however due to paucity of time i will limit my submissions on issue b to the proportionality of the measure showing how it is disproportionate even after taking zana's actions at the assembly into consideration there is nothing on record to suggest that the demonstrators resorted to violence or caused any bodily harm or injury to anyone moreover as is evident from paragraphs 19 and 20 of the record the blockade began after zana's speech and was dispersed even before she could finish her speech there could be sure that no bodily harm was caused by the blocking of the entrance of the hospital i understand that was the only way that patients were able to enter the hospital if someone is in need of urgent medical care that could result in bodily harm uh, yes your i i acknowledge your concern your excellency we submit that there is nothing on record to show that people suffered any tangential harm out of this but in any case like i mentioned the time period of the blockade itself was negligible and therefore the impact of the blockade and the subsequent sentence imposed on zana is one which does not meet the proportionality limit the respondents have relied on the case of kudrivishis versus lithuania to justify their sentence that was imposed on zana before i can give an analysis of that case and show how that case is squarely inapplicable i see that my time is fast elapsing if i could request for an extension of 1 minute to conclude my submissions your excellencies yes go ahead thank you in the case of kudrivishis versus lithuania which the respondents rely upon in their written submissions they state that a 60 day suspended sentence so you may not have time to go through the facts of the case get to the crux Uh, yes your excellency in the case of kudrivishis the blockade which happened was went on for 3 days where an entire highway was blocked in the instant case the entrance of a hospital was blocked for a negligible time period and there is nothing on record to show that anyone was harmed out of this action therefore we submit that to impose criminal sanctions on zana for this action is something which is disproportionate given that they could have again resorted to less restrictive measures like imposing a fine or temporarily detaining zana how does even the being a suspended sentence factor into this uh, your excellencies uh, we submit here that it was held by the european court of human rights in its 2019 decision of martesaru versus republic of moldova that even if a sentence is suspended the chilling effect that the sentence has is not altered one bit and by imposing a disproportionate sanction on a political leader like zana we submit that the chilling effect was something which should be taken into account by this court in its proportionality analysis with that your excellencies we conclude that the applicant's rights under issue b have also been violated by the respondent with that your excellencies i come to a conclusion of my submissions and i thank you for your time and consideration if i may be of any further assistance to this court thank you counsel no thank you Your Excellencies, if I can confirm that I am both visible and audible. Yes. Thank you, Your Excellencies. A very good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are joining from, Your Excellencies. My name is Sunil, and I shall continue the submissions for the applicants in the present case. over the course of the next 15 minutes i shall be addressing this court on issues c and d of the record your excellencies amidst the public health emergency declared by isaac the uncertainty surrounding the actual mode of transmission of the virus still looms large in the country however the respondents have sought to maintain their position on the nidv as a vector borne disease by imposing absolute restrictions on assemblies in online spaces and stifling 
any unfavorable scientific publications on the NIDB, which could contradict their position under the garb of controlling disinformation. In this regard, our first submission is that the statement issued by the state of ISEC on the 16th of March violated the rights of the union under articles 19 and 21 of the ICCPR. And second, the guidelines issued under section 23 of the NSA violated their rights under article 19. Your excellencies, the right to freedom of expression and to peaceful assembly under articles 19 and 21 of the ICCPR are extremely wide in their scope and include the protection of such rights even on online forums. We submit that this statement issued on the 16th of March violated these rights of the applicants as the restrictions under the same fell foul of the three-part test. Counsel, Today, I shall I, be limiting... Yes, Counsel, can, yeah, just, uh, just a question on the statement. When I look at the content of the statement, it seems to be that the government is merely announcing that it is going to enforce the law and it's going to be uh, quite stringent about that. How, how does that amount to a violation of rights? Your Excellencies, in terms of the statement itself, we submit that it violates not only the legality limb of the three-part test, but the proportionality as well. And on the legality limb, we submit that the extension of the sanctions under Section 22 to online assemblies falls foul of the very intention of the legislators of the NSA itself. And second, that the statement itself test of sufficient position. I will first demonstrate that online assemblies fell outside the scope oh, of so Section 20. Does Section 22 confine itself to physical meetings? Could, could it not be interpreted to cover online meetings? Your Excellencies, it would be our submission that the definition of public sites under the NSA was, and the intention of the drafters therein, was to limit it to physical assemblies. And to illustrate the same, if I may invite your attention to page four of the record which contains the definition of public sites. On the first paragraph of page four, public sites shall include but not be limited to public parks, public squares, public thoroughfares and means of public transportation. Your Excellencies, it is our argument today that this list of physical spaces only in the definition of public sites itself means that the intention was to restrict any gatherings and any restrictions on gatherings to public spaces. Is that really Furthermore, a fair, is that really the a fair reading? Itself, is that really a fair reading when the legislator explicitly decided to say that it's not limited to those examples that are enumerated in the law? Especially in this day and age, right? When I you know, <laughs> the distinction between online and offline gatherings is, is, is very thin. So I understand your concern, Your Excellency. However, we submit that on the very uh, on the ground that with respect to this inclusive definition, to then state physical spaces as an example in the definition itself makes the intention of the drafters clear in this regard. And why that is even more applicable in the present context is where I bring the precision of the statement itself into the picture. Your Excellencies, the statement issued on the 16th of March did not, uh, did not qualify the test of being sufficiently precise in terms of the restrictions. It stated that the ministry will be taking strong actions to arrest persons who organize unauthorized gatherings on social media platforms. Your Excellencies, the record and the clarification of the record have do not have any indication on what this authorization regime would look like. To give you an example of how such restrictions are therefore overbroad and are not precise, suppose if I am a member of a new social media platform on in Isaac, if I want to have this online gathering which focuses on my love for botany or poetry or anything which is unrelated to the NIDB or to any healthcare related topic. Do I need to seek authorization for such an assembly? And on what criteria 
would the minister of defense restrict or deny authorization to me furthermore when seeking this authorization the minister of defense is not provided with any time limit with within which he or she has to provide this authorization therefore the minister of defense is provided with excessive discretion to provide to curtail the rights of assembly and expression there under on these online assemblies furthermore your excellencies we submit that with respect to this organization to this authorization scheme itself we do not know whether i think it made sense to perhaps switch our videos on to enable uh, sumit to finish the submissions i think if he turns his off uh, i'm happy to to do that yep yeah. yep yeah, yeah. sumit your excellency is you. yeah is, go back uh, now let's go ahead yeah your excellency is if um, where did uh, my internet um, disrupt the proceedings was i uh, audible during the my submissions on the statement uh, yes you were but uh, you lost your yeah your excellency is demonstrating how the statement did not uh, did not qualify the test of being sufficiently precise we also submit that with respect to there being no time limit provided any online assembly all of these factors combine make this restriction and all of the legality limit i will now turn my attention to the proportionality of these restrictions and in this regard while the applicants acknowledge that controlling this information before you move to that point um i just want to understand is there an issue about the company not being the state and whether or not we can apply uh, the test that you're talking about to a private enterprise your excellencies in the issues before this court today while the national network which is the intermediary in this case has taken the step to disable net assemblies we submit that such a step was taken by the intermediary because of the statement issued by the state of hyderabad because if in this paradigm any intermediary were to continue holding online assemblies or allowing the conduct of online assemblies they could have sanctions brought against them under section 22 because they would be facilitating gatherings on online forums as a result these measures have a chilling effect even on intermediaries your excellencies all of which is arising from state action and not from any private entity i don't need to trouble you further on that point thank you your excellencies coming to the proportionality of these restrictions while we acknowledge that controlling disinformation is indeed important during a public health crisis as has been demonstrated in the covid-19 context we submit that the restrictions imposed here under were extremely disproportionate on two grounds first the state has ignored numerous less restrictive measures it could have employed and second the restrictions employed there under from the statement are both absolute and overly restrictive having a chilling effect what are some of the excellencies coming to the less restrictive measures first what are what are some of the less restrictive uh, measures that he could have uh, imposed certainly uh, your excellencies and with respect to the to controlling misinformation it has been held by the world health organization that when controlling misinformation the first and most important step is for the state to disseminate credible evidence based information pertaining to the disease second it also needs to take steps to increase digital and media literacy and if any restrictions on rights especially of expression are to be placed any such restrictions must conform to the positive obligations to protect these rights in the first place but counsel taken in this regard is a notice and take down 
Isn't that what the state attempted to do in terms of centralizing information uh, and also discouraging disinformation? Where we're talking about a situation where a number of users actually discourage the use of hospitals. Wouldn't that actually result in a public health crisis? And didn't the state actually act within its remit in that context? I acknowledge your concern, uh, Mr. President. However, we submit that in this context, even when there is the threat of disinformation, which the state would has to protect its citizens against, the measures that it has taken are still absolute restrictions. The measures that I propose, such as a notice and takedown measure, essentially target disinformation and remove any dissemination from online forums therein. These are steps which have been taken in several jurisdictions, such as wherein the UK government has worked with intermediaries to ensure that information and posts which could potentially have disinformation are flagged, WHO links are provided under such posts, and if any such disinformation continues to prevail, it is removed from those forums altogether. In the present instance, however, the restrictions are absolute. One cannot now have any net assemblies prevailing whatsoever. We cannot use net tags in our posts, which would link to such net assemblies. And furthermore, there is also a threat of criminal sanctions against the organizers of online assemblies, which is not commensurate to any risk posed by disinformation in this regard. Therefore, Your Excellencies, we submit that on issue C and with respect to the statements from the from the state from the restrictions from the statement itself, they are violative of Articles 19 and 21 of the ICC. I will now turn my attention to the guidelines under Section 23. And in this regard, I will first uh, seek to address Mr. President's concern on the same of how centralization in this particular respect is something that would once again not be the least restrictive measure. Your Excellencies, in understanding these restrictions in the context of the NIDB crisis, it is important to note that even reputed medical organizations such as the Institute of Medical Research in ISIP still cannot confirm whether the NIDB is a sexually transmitted bond disease. In this uncertainty, it becomes all the more important for there to be greater scientific discourse around the same and opinions of medical experts becomes all the more crucial. However, Your Excellencies, the guidelines seek to restrict their opinion and their publications on the garb of controlling misinformation. Furthermore, Your Excellencies, these guidelines also do not have any time limit within which the Ministry of Health has to authorize any potential publication on the NID. But, but looking at the concern. mischief of, uh, that, that, is, that these guidelines are trying to address, it doesn't seem that the government is so concerned with uh, medical experts speaking directly. It, it seems that the government was concerned about ordinary citizens uh, engaging in the dissemination of disinformation. Uh, isn't that the mischief here? Your Excellencies, we submit that the guidelines chose to specifically target medical experts as well, as is evident from the wording of the guidelines on paragraph 27. If I may read for the benefit of the court on page six of the record, forgive me, Your Excellencies. It states that section 23 of the NSA prohibiting the publication of any opinion of any medical expert or other person with respect to NID. It targets the opinions of medical experts and this becomes problematic in the present context, Your Excellencies, because there are people, there are medical experts who claim that the NIDB is a sexually transmitted disease. And all such information could be blocked by the state because it hampers their narrative that the NIDB is a vector bond disease on the basis of which they have curtailed physical gatherings as well as online gatherings. I will now turn to my final limb in this regard on how such and therefore would be proportionate. Your Excellencies, the lesser restrictive measures I mentioned in issue C apply squarely in this regard as well. Whereas with respect to publications specifically, we submit that enabling um, more publications in the scientific community is something that should be encouraged in this regard. 
I, I understand your excellencies. And if I could um, seek 30 seconds to conclude my submissions uh, before this call. Yes, uh, I think that's fine. Yeah. Thank you, your excellencies. Coming uh, specifically to uh, the last of your excellencies, we submit that any opinion dissenting against the state's position, therefore, could be curbed by the state. And therefore, your excellencies, on both issues C and D, we see that the respondents and the restrictions placed thereunder have violated the article, the applicant's rights under articles 19 and 21, with which I conclude my submissions today. It was a pleasure to argue for this court. And I thank your excellencies for your time and consideration. Uh, good afternoon, your excellencies. May I check that I can be heard? Perfect. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you all. May it please the court, my name is Alexander Haynes and I appear alongside my learned co-counsel, Mr Jennings, on behalf of the state of Ized, the respondent in the present action. I will be speaking to you for approximately 15 minutes today, covering issues what, uh, A and B, and Mr Jennings will then speak for a further 15 minutes covering issues B, uh, C and D. In delivering my submissions today, Your Excellencies, I shall follow the format of the three-part test, demonstrating that restrictions were firstly lawful, that they were in pursuit of a legitimate aim, and thirdly, that they were necessary and proportionate in a democratic society. Before going any further, Your Excellencies, I would like to remind the court of the primacy of Article 6 of the ICCPR, the right to life. The right to life is a prerequisite for the enjoyment of all other rights, and once it has been violated, the effects are permanent. There is no remedy for death. Death is irreversible. Without further ado, I will now begin with issue A. Before, namely you, that continue, second... before you continue, uh, th that's of course very difficult to argue with that uh, as the moment that life ends, uh, human rights are of, of very little use, but there's also um, clear doctrine that all human rights are equal, right? Uh, and that there's actually no formal hierarchy between the different rights that we find in the ICCPR. Could you elaborate on that just a little bit more? Uh, yes, Your Excellency. This leads me to uh, one of the proportionality and necessity arguments uh, that I make. My submission is that whilst all rights must be considered equal, there is a certain balancing act that must be accomplished. Your Excellency, there has been a pressing social need in Ized for the implementation of these restrictions caused by the virus. This is a the virus has killed so far between 560 and 2000 people with more than 35,000 infections. This gives a mortality rate in the country of approximately 7% at its higher end, which is far higher than coronavirus. And as such, Your Excellencies, this is a very real public health crisis and measures must be taken to help curtail the spread of the virus. As such, I would like to rely on the principle of preventative measures, which were relied upon in the European Court of Human Rights case of Kolyadenko and Russia, where it was found that in the case of a natural disaster, there was a need for the state to have taken preventative me measures to prevent this disaster. Also, and I... Just to interrupt you, should this court be cautious about uh, the, the chances or the, 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 the ability for governments to actually use the phrase uh, pressing social need uh, to actually uh, further their own interests uh, and in this context to actually suppress an opposition. Should this court be cautious about uh, taking your word for it? Uh, Your Excellency, I'm very grateful for the question. Uh, I would like to reiterate that this pressing social need is a public health crisis. The government is not seeking to benefit in any way from this. Um, indeed, there is no accusation, uh, or there is no case that these measures are uh, disproportionately affecting uh, opposition groups. Indeed, assemblies have taken place at the park, and that provision is there to enable these preventative well, measures. Point, counsel, isn't that precisely what the, uh, the applicants are suggesting, that in, in fact there is no real public health crisis, that this is all, all a sort of ruse to, to suppress opposition voices and dissent? Uh, Your Excellency, I would direct you 
to the fact pattern uh, and indeed the applicants to the fact pattern to highlight uh, the spread of this virus. 500 and, between 560 and 2000 people have died. This is not a negligible number. Um, a mortality rate of 7% is very high, certainly by uh, viral uh, standards. Um, and where the state can indeed take preventative measures, as is Ed can, as we have at the fact pattern point 10, where experts claim and uh, describe how this could well be transmitted by mosquitoes, and when the Independent Institute of Medical Research can provide no conclusive evidence to the contrary, the, the theory that mosquitoes are the vector of transmission is very credible, and as such, mosquitoes constitute a known hazard. Your Excellency, precautions can be taken to mitigate this threat. Well, hang such... on a second, uh, Mr. Haynes. There's a, a question here uh, about, um, uh, on your analysis, essentially any um, theory without scientific backing uh, could result in censorship and uh, restrictions on rights. Where do you say the limits of those things are drawn? What are you saying that we as a court are allowed to uh, judge this uh, framework against? Your Excellency, the uh, government is making its decisions based on the advice of credible advisers. And as such, it is held that the court should give discretion to state actors where they have been advised by credible expert advisers. We are not, see, we are not basing our um, assessment off of um, our own interpretation. It's very much that advice coming through from the experts. And as such, when the Independent Institute of Medical Research cannot refute uh, this, uh, this theory and this assumption, the state should act. Especially, at Your Excellency, as the state can take these preventative measures, any omission to impose these restrictions yeah, but could the then- I'm making is that where along that line is it appropriate for the government to infringe upon individual human rights if we have a mere theory and it isn't a universally or largely universally accepted fact? Uh, Your Excellency, I just highlight the gravity, that 7% figure, once again, of uh, the mortality rate of this virus. We are not, if had this figure been lower and had the death toll been a lot lower, there would be a very real argument that restrictions were not necessary. And sadly, as has been proven at point 27, I believe, of the fact pattern, these restrictions have brought the, uh, the mortality rate down, the infection rate down. So as such, the mosquito, the theory that this was transmitted by mosquitoes is credible. Does that answer your question, Your Excellency? Uh, I'm not going to detain you further on it. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Um, as such, Your Excellency, the state's, these positive obligations to take preventative measures extends not only to the participants, but also to non-participants. There is an existing strain on the healthcare system, Your Excellencies, and an increased infection rate caused by unauthorised gatherings at unsafe locations would further exacerbate this uh, pressing social need for restrictions, and it would deny independent non-participants the right to access the highest quality of healthcare. And finally, on proportionality, Your Excellencies, this was not a blanket ban. A safe venue had been provided along with all necessary support. The park satisfied the sight and sound concept as it was often visited by members of the public. And as such, it was highly likely that any target audience would have been reached either in person at the park or through media reports subsequently. How reasonable is a park in the context of a population of 20 million people? Your Excellencies, it is not an ideal situation. However, these are time-limited sure. measures. These are time-limited measures taken for the protection of public health. Uh, as such, the state is very much uh, uh, conducting a balancing act between the right to life and protecting that right, as well as respecting the right to freedom of assembly. Um, does that answer your question, Your Excellency? Mr. Mr. Haynes, apart from the, uh, the proportionality of designating just one site for, for, for public gathering, what about the proportionality of uh, actually imposing criminal sanctions for the violation of, of the relevant section? Is that proportionate? 
Your Excellency, thank you for your question in drawing me on to issue B. Um, for this, I would like to rely on the case of Kudrevicius and uh, politely uh, reject the uh, uh, applicant's admission that we are mistaken in our interpretation of the case. Uh, Your Excellency, the case of in the case of Kudrevicius, uh, the protesters' actions in blocking roads constituted a reprehensible act and custodial sentences could be applied. I also note at point 40 of the applicant's memorial. Absolutely. Is... Before, before you proceed, I, I need to interject there. The question here is not so much in terms of uh, acts of blocking a hospital or a road, but actually violating the, the, the rule or the prescription that only in one site can one gather. That is the criminal sanction that the section actually refers to. So, so what is the proportionality of that? Because it's actually relevant to issue A as opposed to issue B. Uh, in that case, Your Excellency, I'd like to draw you on to uh, a line of human rights committee reasoning that reinforces that the onus is not only on the government, but also on protesters to ensure safe protest and facilitate a safe protest. In the European Court of Human Rights case of Berlodeer and others in Russia, the appellants were found partly culpable in refusing to, uh, to change the location of their protest in response to a government request. Moreover, Ms. Zana has also failed in her duties as an organiser in giving short notice to the government of her chosen location. In the case of Erzsefides Leben in Austria, there was insufficient time for the state to redeploy police resources to ensure a safe process. In the present case, this, there has been insufficient time for the state to adopt preventative measures to protect the protesters, as well as to uh, ensure the continual functioning of the hospital. Uh, and which... On that point, I think you raise an interesting point, but when the target of a protest is in fact the government, uh, would it make sense for protesters to actually give the government notice uh, ahead of a protest? Wouldn't that defeat the purpose of the protest itself? Your Excellency, in normal times, I would agree with you. However, in the present case where there is a public health emergency and the state is specifically trying to bring this virus under control to protect the lives of not only the participants in the protest, but the rights of those who are not participating. Uh, there must be some margin uh, allowed to the government to take these measures uh, to sadly curtail certain rights. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, so returning to Kudrevicius and the applicant's statement, they state at point 40 of their memorial that the impact of the blockade on the hospital was negligible. Of course, the fact pattern does not clarify the condition of those 40 people who are turned away. However, any delay in seeking medical care can prove fatal. A missed cancer diagnosis can be equally as fatal as a more obvious case of someone bleeding out through an artery. And as such, the Special Rapporteur's joint report of the 4th of February 2016 specifically allows for the dispersal of protests that take place and that prevent access to essential services, such as blocking the emergency entrance to a hospital. Now in Kudrevicius, whilst the applicants uh, caused significant inconvenience over the course of three days, their behavior in uh, blocking roads when other alternatives had been provided uh, constituted a quote, reprehensible act and custodial sentences were applicable. These penalties, Your Excellencies, were suspended for a year, similar to the present case. In addition, in the present case, the, uh, the authorities have only imposed 25% of the maximum permissible sentence. This shows a degree of leniency and uh, as such highlights is as desire to balance the rule of law with the rights of both participants and non-participants and avoid any chilling effects. This also follows on from the case of G and Germany where the appellant had caused more disruption than would otherwise normally arise from the exercise of the right to peaceful assembly, which also rendered a criminal conviction proportionate. With regards to returning to the dispersal at the hospital, this can also be uh, viewed as an extrapolation of the Indian Supreme Court case of Amit Sani and Commissioner of Police and others. This was, the Indian Supreme Court found there was a need to balance the rights of protesters with the rights of commuters who had been unfairly impacted by the protest. Extrapolating this to public health, 
there is a distinct need to balance the rights of protesters who are seeking the right to assemble with the rights of patients who are seeking the right to health care, to seek health care, which is further enshrined by the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights under Article, 40, uh, Article 12 of that covenant. Uh, in addition to this, we've, there has been precedent for uh, dispersal at hospitals. Last year in Los Angeles, uh, a, hospital, a, a gathering took place outside a hospital where two wounded police officers were being treated. The protesters blocked the access to the hospital and as such were deemed to be an illegal gathering and were subsequently dispersed. And uh, your excellencies, I note my time is running low. And uh, by way of a summary, I would like to remind the court that this is an incredibly novel situation. Public health has never been invoked in the context of restricting rights in such a way to protect the fundamental right to life in the midst of a public health emergency. Current cases dealing with coronavirus have yet to reach a high level of appeal, and there have been very few, if any, cases dealt with at an international level. As such, Your Excellencies, this is an opportunity for the court to provide a judgment that can confirm the rights and the powers that states have in order to protect the lives of its citizens. And unless I can be of further assistance to the court, I will now cede the floor to Mr Jennings, who shall continue with issues C and D. Thank you. I'm just, I'm just going to take a moment uh, to, take, to open a window uh, where I am, if you excuse me a second. I'm not leaving the room. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Your Excellencies. Can, can you see and hear me? Good, okay, thank you, great. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Rafe Jennings and I'll be representing the respondent in this matter uh, on issue C and D. Um, now we recognize that the statement of the 16th of March complained of in issue C and the guidelines uh, complained of in issue D, do both constitute interferences with articles 19 and 21 rights. Um, and as such, the majority of my submissions will concern a, a positive case for the permissibility of these interferences. Um, so first, my, my first broad set of submissions will concern the legality of both sets of measures. Uh, my second will, will concern the, the legitimate aim pursued. And then finally, I'll address the uh, necessity and proportionality, uh, uh, at which point I, I will address the measures separately. Um, until that point, I'll be addressing them equally. Now, on, on the, on the um, legality of both measures, I, I wish to start this section by um, addressing something that the applicants, or, or two points that the applicants have made. Uh, firstly, the, the applicants say that the um, section 22 of the NSA did not empower the minister to address online gatherings. Now, it is our submission that the court should completely sidestep this issue. The court should not be getting involved in the question of statutory interpretation, especially when the most competent court to make that decision, the Supreme Court of Izzet, has ruled that the measures are legal in their constitutional ruling. Now, support for this view can be found in the Human Rights Committee cases of Anna Marifidou versus Sweden and uh, Leonardo de Groot versus the Netherlands, where the logic was, was that, that those courts didn't have the competence to act as a final court of appeal. On that point, even if this court was not to focus on the, the legality, Lynn, uh, we would be concerned about the necessity of um, restricting online gatherings uh, on the basis of public health concerns. How does a restriction on online gatherings, uh, as opposed to a physical gathering, actually reduce the chances of infection? Uh, of this virus. I think that's, that's what this court is going to be concerned with. Thank you, Your Excellencies. In which case, I will move directly on to the, the kind of the pressing social need for specifically online measures. Now, it's our submission that the disinformation that is found on um, social media gatherings is extremely harmful and um, the combating of online disinformation is necessary for a public health response. Now, a number of international organizations, including the WHO, 
uh, have said that pandemics and epidemics are often accompanied by what they uh, term as infodemics, and that the, the addressing of disinformation online um, is, is an important aspect of uh, the public health threat presented by a disease. Um, now, on that point, it's important to note there is a specific nuance of this case, which is it's almost never present, which is that the main uh, people coming out with the disinformation content are those either in or tangentially associated with a healthcare union, which adds a veneer of respectability and credibility, which would otherwise be uh, not present in your average disinformation content. And as such, that justifies treating this disinformation as especially harmful. So even where the WHO may typically say uh, that um, restraint on speech should not be imposed in the case of disinformation, this case can be distinguished by the especially harmful content. Um, can I ask so, a question there, though? Because yes, uh, the, yes. the guidelines, as I understand them, uh, do not focus on disinformation only. It asks for basically pre-publication control of any opinion. Yes, Your Excellency. Uh, it, it's, it's true that the guidelines don't specifically focus on disinformation. Uh, we would nonetheless submit that they, are, they have been intended to focus on disinformation. Uh, the reason why they do not re require disinformation is because it's necessary to have a, a pre-publication verification of, of the quality of information that's coming out. Now, this is especially true given the fact of um, this, this case being a novel pandemic where high quality information is, is at an absolute uh, premium. So they do, they do address disinformation, they don't directly reference disinformation. Um, and on that point, it's important to note that there is no good evidence or reason to suggest that the government has any goals here except to facilitate the end of this crisis as quickly as possible. I mean, this is a democratically elected government that abides by rule of law principles. Um, and to suggest that this is entirely a measure to um, suppress opposition uh, really doesn't stand up to evidential scrutiny. Now, the government themselves in... Could, sorry, uh, Your Excellency, please. If I could uh, redirect your attention to issue C and yes. the statement uh, under scrutiny. Uh, now, would it be necessary to prohibit effectively uh, all online gatherings uh, in the interest of public health? These, these are not just gatherings that, are, that pertain to uh, the specific protest. It, it's a, it seems to be a blanket uh, prohibition. And it, can that be necessary for the, in the interest of public health? Yes, yes, Your Excellency, we think it is necessary in the interests of public health. And the reason we hold that view is we believe that, uh, contrary to what the applicants have said, there would actually be no less restrictive measures that would be effective. And as such, the breadth of the statement uh, is a necessary part of its effectiveness. Uh, now, in the Human Rights Committee... Oh, can, can, can you just explain to me how effectively censoring the entire population uh, is a proper and proportionate response? Well, uh, it, it is certainly a very restrictive interference, uh, that much we admit. However, um, on, on that note, we do, uh, we do note that this is, these are time-restricted responses to the exigencies of a public health crisis, uh, which as my um, co-counsel has, has Okay, so let's, I, I take that point, I understand where you're going, so you don't need to pursue it, but the... Does time limited effectively give you a free pass on total restrictions? Well, your excellency, of, of course. Can I, can I just add to that so you can answer both questions in one go, which is like, uh, how does this relate to uh, the contribution actually that exchange about these important issues between medical professionals in the public sphere, uh, how does it can contribute to actually solving this crisis? I will deal with those two separately because I believe uh, Your Excellency uh, Mark Stevens' question concerns the statement and uh, Your Excellency Reverend Lowe's question concerns the guidelines. So um, regarding the proportionality of why it's necessary to impose restrictions on the entirety of the country online, um, it's important to note that both Articles 19 and 21, uh, although they do apply online, th there is no separate right to online um, assembly or online uh, freedom of speech. So, so the right to assembly is still available via the, the, the public park, which has been designated. Um, and so 
although that it seems broad in when in in abstraction as an online restriction this is in fact not a broad restriction on the rights themselves uh, but is specific to uh, the the online cases now it's also true that the um the danger on social media of dis of the spread of disinformation comes from its extreme virality the fact that it can spread incredibly fast and can come up from any place now um this in part ties to the question of predictability which is another thing that um the the applicants talked about which is that um the the measures sorry the um the applicants were concerned with the predictability of um so, some parts of the of section 22 of the nsa and and the reason why it needs to be so broadly framed is because there is an incredible um diversity inherent in where um disinformation can present itself and that's drawing on um a certain line from a, a european court case called galstian versus armenia where it was um where it was recognized that certain offenses have such a diversity inherent in them that there is a need for the flexibility in the laws. Now, the, the chance of disinformation presenting itself online um, is, is, is there's such a wide possibility of this, that there's, there needs to be a, a flexibility in the laws themselves. Now, on to the second point of, of the guidelines. Um, Before you proceed uh, to that point, uh, uh, Council, in the case of uh, physical gatherings, the government actually took the step of designating a site Whereas it doesn't seem to want to do that when it comes to online gatherings. Uh, could it not have actually designated certain online sites for the purposes of gathering in the same way it did for, pub, for, for physical gatherings? And would, wouldn't that have been a more proportionate response to the problem? Uh, I think the, the, the issue I, I would have with that is that it um, concerns technical capabilities that we have no evidence that the government may have. It, it seems in theory like it could be a, a, a possibly proportionate measure. However, again, there is still this problem of the virality of disinformation that can spread on social media. And so that, that is the main concern and that is what justifies the breadth. So, so sorry, uh, onto your excellency, um, Reverend Lowe's question about whether there is the need for a free flow of information in a time of uncertainty. Now, to that we would respond, there is a tension inherent in Article 19 between the uh, right to impart information, which may be wrong, and the right to receive high quality information. Now, um, the, what the guidelines are trying to do is the guidelines are trying to um, improve access to high quality information and temporarily uh, giving the access to high quality information precedent over the right to impart possibly erronous disinformation. Can now, explain we, where this qualification of high quality information comes from in Article 19 that you read into that? Um, yes, Your Excellency, that is not specifically from Article 19, but it, it can be found in a, um, one moment, I'm just looking for my notes. Yes, so in, in the special uh, rapporteur for freedom of expression and pandemics, David Kaye's report, uh, he says that, access to high quality information is required for autonomy and the capacity to think clearly, which is really the heart of what um, of what article 20, of what article 19 is about in terms of uh, the necessity, um, it, the kind of democratic elements of, of article 19. But Mr Jennings, uh, I, I would um, hasten to add that uh, the special rapporteur wouldn't have suggested that uh, centralizing information would be one way of achieving uh, that goal of disseminating high quality information. To that, again, I would respond, Your Excellency, that this is a uh, unique situation in which there is an especially high credence given to the disinformation content, given its tangential link to um, these healthcare workers. Um, and, and furthermore, it, the, 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 inf the disinformation is, is very um, well targeted and it, it, isn't, it isn't kind of a, a, dif a diffuse environment of, of various disinformation. This is a, a targeted um, campaign by the, um, by, by the union to suggest that there is settled science, that the, 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 the NIDV is only sexually transmitted. Now, we agree that there, it, it isn't disinformation to say it may be um, tr sexually transmitted because the government recognizes that's one of the possibilities for its transmission. 
However, to represent an, an uncertainty as a certainty knowingly, we would argue constitutes disinformation as it's falsely and deliberately representing something which is uncertain as settled. Um, now, Your Excellencies, I, I, I wish to return to the, uh, to the, the breadth of, um, of, the, of the statement and, and the need for the breadth. And, and there is um, authority in the Human Rights Committee's general comment number 34 for putting wide scale impositions on certain forms of expression where legitimately prohibitable content cannot be severed from the form itself. And so our, our, our argument in terms of the, the requirement um, and, and the lack of any less restrictive measures being affected in terms of putting the, the broad imposition of the statement. Also, is that, would I be incorrect in saying that the reference there made by the committee uh, would not be to uh, information that could fall within the category of misinformation, but generally information that could pose a, a more uh, clear violation of, of rights, for example, hate speech. Uh, would, would this court uh, need to be a little bit more cautious about uh, recognizing that kind of uh, breadth in authority when it comes to misinformation? Your Excellency um, talks about misinformation, but we have to be clear, this is as much about disinformation, i.e. Um, deliberately misleading people for, um, for nefarious aims. And, and, and the disinformation is in fact more viral, we would say, than the misinformation, because it is people deliberately misrepresenting um, facts about the, the, the status of the transmissibility of the virus. And so, but but uh, wouldn't that be a question of interpretation? Because we're talking about one opposing party that has a particular political position that it believes is, is to be true uh, versus the government's position, whereas disinformation would be where a party actually understands that it is false information that is being dis disseminated. So it's a matter of interpretation as to whether it's disinformation or misinformation. Your Excellency, I disagree because it is not a matter of interpretation as to whether the science is settled. It, it, it is not settled. And to represent it as if it is, is, is to knowingly uh, mis misrepresent the facts. Now, Your Excellency, I, I see that my time is up. Um, so that concludes our submissions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we can move on to rebuttals and um, so rebuttal. Your Excellency, I think we have three minutes of time now to confer before we present our uh, rebuttals because we're in different rooms. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead.
I'm not, I'm not sure if the applicants have seen, but that, that is their time up. Yes. Yeah. Um, your Excellencies, before I move to my rebuttals, I'd like to confirm once again that I am both uh, audible and visible to this court. Thank you. Uh, Your Excellencies, we have four points of rebuttal before this court today. On issue A, the respondents in their oral submissions have failed to address and adequately respond to our case. Since the three-part test is a conjunctive test, the respondents have the necessary obligation of defending all three limbs of the test, failing which a violation of Articles 19 and 21 would be established. General Comment 37, at paragraph 39, note that the law must be sufficiently precise to members of the society. Despite this, the respondents completely fail to address our arguments on the legality of Section 22 as to how the phrase conduct or facilitate the conducting is precise enough for an ordinary rights bearer in IZID to reasonably foresee if they would be liable under this section. For the necessity of their restrictions, the respondents state that they must take preventative action and therefore operate on the threshold that the disease is vector borne. But they fail to notice that our submissions on the necessity limb were in the paradigm that NIDV is vector borne indeed. The respondents have neither addressed how the measures are necessary in light of the World Health Organization guidelines on vector borne diseases, nor have they justified why the multiple less restrictive measures recommended by us were not resorted to. On issue B, I have already shown how the respondent's reliance on Kudrivishis is unfounded, given that that case had a three-day blockade of an entire highway, while the blockade here was only for a period less than that of Zana's speech. The respondent's reliance on the Indian Supreme Court decision of Amit Sani versus Commissioner Police is inapplicable as well, as it has been widely criticized by multiple organizations like the Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, and we respectfully submit that the Indian standard of human rights law is different than the standard that must be held in this court. On issue C and D, we submit that the respondent conceded that the nature of restrictions placed on expression and assembly in online spaces was extremely wide, but sought to justify the same by pointing to the time period of these restrictions. However, this justification fails to acknowledge that it does not prevent the violation of applicants' rights at the outset, and second, Given the prevailing healthcare emergency, the government is empowered to and to extend the applicability of these restrictions for however long it deems fit. Lastly, the respondents agree in light of the uncertainty on the NIDV that it was not appropriate to state that only one particular mode of transmission was correct. However, that demonstrates the clear contradiction in their position where they seek to impose restrictions based on NIDV being a vector borne disease and curb all information which says otherwise, even when it comes from important stakeholders like medical experts. That, Your Excellencies, concludes the rebuttals for the applicant. I thank you once again for your time and consideration. We would like to exercise our right to three minutes to prepare our SIR rebuttal, if that's okay, Your Excellencies. Yes, of course.
Okay, Your Excellencies, I'm ready to begin my Sarabatali, if you're ready for it. So in response to the first issue they raised, we agree that the tests are conjunctive. Uh, regarding specifically the foreseeability of Section 22, we would refer to the case we did raise in our submission, which is Gaustian, which is part of a string of European court cases, which suggests that perfect predictability is neither achievable nor desirable, uh, and that there is a need to be flexible. Now, in this case, especially given the exigencies of the circumstances, there is an especially high need to be flexible. We would also respectfully disagree with the suggestion that uh, blocking a highway for three days, as was the case in Kudrevichus, is far graver than turning 40 people away from a hospital. In fact, we would hold that given the threat that presents itself possibly to the right to life from turning 40 people away from a hospital, let alone the general right to health, uh, is in fact far more serious than, um, than blocking a highway for three days, which, if, if anything, causes a, a mere inconvenience. So in fact, we would say that in the instant matter, Kudrevichus is not only a good authority, but a particularly strong one. Now, responding to their second point, they asked us to uh, explain why the government was not following WHO guidelines on uh, mosquito-borne diseases. According to their own admissions of what those guidelines are, um, th those guidelines require governments to take hygiene measures. Now, fumigation is the reason why uh, all of these restrictions were placed on the public park was the ability to fumigate it. So in fact, this is a hygiene based restriction. So we really think there is absolutely nothing in that, uh, in, in that point uh, at all. Now, the, the applicants in their third point question whether the time limits um, really made the difference. And, and, and we brought up the time limits in talking to the proportionality of the measures. Now, um, it's true that certain measures may be interfered with, but again, both Article 19 and 21 do facilitate permissible interferences, and it, the time limits really speak to the proportionality of those permissible interferences. Now, of course, those time limits can't be baked in because we have no guarantee that the emergency will be over in three months. And as such, there is a need for the um, executive to retain the power to extend the time limits in order to meet the requirements of the circumstance. And on their final point, we have always maintained that um, the, the, there is a chance that this disease is sexually transmitted, and we have only seek to rely on the credible threat that is mosquito-borne. Um, and, and that is exactly the point that my, uh, my learned co-counsel raised talking about Kolya Denko, which is that certain credible threats do create a positive obligation on states to take measures to protect against that threat. So those are our four responses. Thank you. Thank you, uh, the judges will now deliberate upon the outcome of this case. Everyone is requested to stay and wait in this room of the court for a few minutes. After their discussion, the judges will be providing their comments. Sorry, Nevena, I think you're on mute. Oh my God, I'm on mute all the time. Uh, I was saying something, thank you so much. I move judges, so hopefully uh, they're in the room already. 
But while we wait, I wanted to tell you that uh, Moreau Price is also here with us and he watched the finals. So I'm going to ask him to unmute himself and hopefully uh, turn on his video so we can hear from him as well. Hello, everybody. Hi, Congrats Mark. Congratulations on the arguments. It was, very, it was a wonderful experience. Touches. It's it's, uh, it's interesting to see the um, different styles, uh, different um, uh, perceptions of the of the ICCPR. Uh, it, I thought the debate brought out very strongly different views on major issues in, in the ICCPR. So I thought that was really excellent. It, does, it doesn't always happen that way. So that was very interesting. Thank you very much. And it, it was nice seeing the, the judge, the different judges and their familiarity with the facts and with the issues, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Moro. I also invite you just to unmute yourself so we can chat a little bit until um, judges deliberate. Can I can I just say congratulations to all uh, both of the applicants? That was an incredibly strong performance. I was, I was really uh, blown away. So so thank you. Likewise, I'd like to add my congratulations to them as well. Thank you so much. I think we had a great round, and this was very very compelling arguments made from. The response as well, so it should be. And we can see why you all have made it to the finals. <laughs> it was a great, great argument. Yes. Also, can I say thank you to to Nevener as well because I can imagine this must be exhausting even in person, but doing this online must be really, really tough. Um, so, so thank you so much. He seems to have been working inexhaustibly. So, so thank you. It's very nice. It's also it's a kind of a high wire act with the technology and the. Is this brooding honor presence that it might break down at any moment and there might be a crisis that's unresolvable. So you're sitting there praying that you can get through the argument and through the, the whole thing. So, so congratulations to Nevin and to Sarah as well. Yes. I mean, we'd like just we'd just like to say that we've often noticed how online pleadings get a bit messed up and you know it's not very well organized due to certain constraints, but I, I, we really have to thank Nevin and the other organizers as well uh, for, for ensuring that the rounds, they, they went on time, they operated smoothly. And even the connectivity issues that we faced, teams were usually very accommodative. And they even the judges were when they, they let us stop time, they let us make sure our connection got back. So we just like to thank the judges and the teams we faced as well for accommodating our request. Thank you so much for nice words. So definitely. One of the mo biggest challenges were doing the scheduling and you, some of you saw Camille, so she is the brains behind that and all the time zones and everything and trying to accommodate everybody not to plead in the middle of the night and similar things, which might get, might can happen like in real life if you are in a criminal law, but we are not in the criminal law. So uh, definitely uh, Camille is not here today, but she will be as well, Sanya Samtani. She also accommodated a couple of your matches during this week, but uh, together with Sarah, all four of us managed to go through this week and all past couple of months. And we are very, very happy that we can, we could keep Moot alive. So you can plead in this environment, which is not the perfect as we are used to, but I'm also sure we will have the opportunity in future years to go back to normal. And this was really significant, significant experience for us as well, because it showed us that teams um, are also willing to participate and maybe some kind of different hybrid systems can happen in future years. So we can allow 
uh, allow teams that can't make it. And we usually have a bunch of visa issues and fundraising issues and so on. So we'll see how that will go. Sarah, open, your, open up your camera so people can see you too. Hi, Sarah. So I just wanted uh, to, um, Monroe, can I just, just say to everybody that I hope can hear that we also really like to keep in touch with all of our um, participants and judges and everybody. So um, when you have a look at the online brochure, which I hope you've all had a, a chance to look at, there's a little section where you can subscribe to our newsletter or anything like that. And just keep in touch with us because it's really important uh, for us that we keep in touch with all our moot family. We have loads of people who really help us with judging, organizing, all sorts of things who are past participants in the moot. So I would really encourage you to do that. We, we love to keep in touch. So, um, and if there's anything, any questions or anything, do get in touch with me. I can help you with anything um, related to that. Sarah, can you say a few words about the Bonavera Institute? I'm not sure everyone knows the oh. housing in which this is taking place. Well, so, um, gosh, that's a very big responsibility. So um, the Price Moot Court competition is now, um, comes under the Bonavera Institute of Human Rights, um, which does all sorts of very important and interesting work on human rights in all sorts of areas. Um, and in fact, um, Professor Kate O'Regan is going to be here this afternoon at the awards ceremony. So I will ask her maybe to tell you a little bit about Bonavero um, at that. I think that would be, be a, an appropriate way to do that. But um, yeah, and, and again, you, you'll have all seen our website and seen lots of stuff about that. So, but I will ask Kate to say something about that this afternoon, Monroe. Okay, thank you. I don't know if you had the opportunity to look at the brochure, but I'm sure you will have. Um, yes? Somebody wanted to say something, feel free. Well, the other thing I thought was interesting is how close the case is to everyday events. I wondered how the different uh, participants felt about that, bringing a different perspective to what you read in the newspaper or, or watch on television. So do, do any of you have any reaction to that? Did it sharpen your attitude towards government action or inaction? Well, I was, I was just thinking, Monroe, maybe one of the reasons why it was easier to adopt the position of the respondents was because we'd become so, so used to being kept in lockdown for almost a whole year that we had completely lost any sense of having assembly rights or anything like that. I was like, well, of course, it's completely normal that everyone should be locked down all the time, isn't it? That's, <laughs> that's normal life these days. Yeah, um, that's interesting. And on, on that regard, it's, it's quite strange just to comment that none of us on Team 104 have actually met each other in person, ever. We've got this far without ever having actually. Oh, I see. That's also quite amazing because uh, you're all aware that we ask you for the feedback and to answer a couple of questions for our brochure. And what we notice the most is that a lot of you never saw each other in person and uh, you managed to work as a team and to get this far, which is quite amazing. And you, you will be able to see in our brochure the reflections from all of you that we, uh, from some of you that we put in, but I would like to cite one. I love it. We, for, we put it as a first one, if you haven't seen it yet. So uh, Alosius Bresnan from Asia Pacific uh, Regional Rounds as a participant said, um, I, actually, I actually got gifted a puppy on the last day of the competition and my family decided to name him Moot. Uh, <laughs> we loved it so much. And Sarah got a puppy just recently, and I suggested the same, but she didn't. Um, she didn't want it to listen to me. I also suggested Moro, which is also mm -hmm. fine. Uh, and the third option can be Nevena, even if it is. Oh, a that's very really nice. <laughs> Oh, I also wanted to say that uh, one of the pleasures for me and other uh, judges uh, who have been associated with the mood is to meet people and talk to them. And uh, some friendships have been sparked through that. So I would encourage you, if you're interested, you can write me uh, with your, your experiences, et cetera, et cetera. And 
I'll, I'll, I'll try to write back. So my, my email address is monroe.price at gmail.com. Pretty easy. We don't have a puppy, so I can't. But I would say price mood is a good name for a puppy. Yeah. So the puppy does actually have a name, but I mean, I'm going to show him to you so you can all decide what, which should be his name. Oh, lovely. So there he is, Monroe. Do you think he looks like you? <laughs> <laughs> I've been I've been battling a puppy all week around my feet, eating my feet. You got muted. I was just saying I've had this running around under my feet, nipping my ankles all the while. So I've been trying to keep very serious and manage my work at the same time. Other judges, what's happening? Mm. What? What is, are the judges judging? What is yeah. happening? Huh? Yeah. Do you mean now or the awards? So now we're judges are deliberating on the outcome of this finals. So we are waiting for them to come back. Will they announce who it is or that's at the awards? But actually, I'd just like to take this uh, opportunity to actually congratulate all the teams who made it to the world rounds. And um, I mean, we recognize how difficult it was to operate during this pandemic and everyone facing different issues. I mean, like, like the other team mentioned as well, they haven't met each other at all and they still managed to you know, perform so well. We, I mean, fortunately, we've met before, but we haven't met since the competition started because we've been in lockdown since a year. And, you know, everyone might be facing different health issues. For example, our third teammate, uh, we think he has COVID. I think he just got tested today and he might have COVID. So we're all just, you know, working in very difficult circumstances. And to make it to the world rounds itself is something I think, you know, all of us uh, deserve, deserve huge congratulations for. So congratulations to all the teams, especially those who were kind enough to take out their time to watch the finals. Do we know which schools they are now in Evina, or is that still? So at this stage, we can announce because judges are uh, just a second. I have a question, just a second. Um, sorry. So at this stage, we can say, uh, and reveal the identity of finalists because judges are in the liberation room so, so they can't hear us. So team 104, it's a team, uh, it's from the, it's City University of London. And team 205 um, is National Law School of India University. Which, which National Law School? Which city? Bangalore, National Law School. Oh, Bangalore. 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 Yes. Sorry. I've actually been on the campus of National Law School of Bangalore very long ago, in the early days of the, of the campus, I would say. Oh, that's great. Unfortunately, we haven't been on campus since, since more than a year now, and we don't really know when we'll be back. So, unfortunately. People want to say that you're in New York, you are the judges, for example. Where, where are you physically now? We're all in our hometown. So I, I'm from the city of Mumbai and one another teammate of mine is in the same city, but we haven't been able to meet each other, meet each other for a year because of lockdown. And now our city just had a second lockdown imposed yesterday because cases are rising again. Yes. So, and our third teammate, the second speaker today, Sumit, he comes from the city of Lucknow, which is in the oh. north of India. So we're all from different, we're all in different cities uh, currently, yeah. We, we've also been to Lucknow and to the Revolutionary Park in Lucknow. It's a very, very interesting facility in a different, interesting place. We can see judges are back, just, uh, yeah. 
Let me just see if we can, is Geham back? Yeah, perfect. So judges, the floor is yours. All right, um, as you can tell from the, the length of time we spent in deliberation, uh, it was a very close mood uh, and we're almost, uh, we're almost sad to actually announce a winner because it, for, for me it was, a, and for, for my colleagues, it was an extremely close call. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're, we're gonna announce who won and then we're also going to announce who uh, we thought was the best oralist. Um, so the applicants, in our opinion, won uh, today's moot. So congratulations to the applicants. Um, and uh, the best oralist uh, for the finals was uh, oralist number two for the respondents, uh, Mr. Jennings. We were very impressed with his, uh, with his um, presentation. Uh, I'll just give a few very general comments. Uh, as I said before, the quality of this moot was exceptional. We are extremely impressed by all four speakers. Um, I think uh, I was particularly impressed uh, by the skill in which uh, the speakers handled the questions. I, I know uh, some of my questions were a little, uh, you know, borderline irritating, uh, but uh, I think it was it was handled rather uh, elegantly and and uh, always. Uh, with a lot of poise and I was impressed by that. I was less impressed by the speaker's time management. I think uh, most of the speakers uh, actually struggled with, with time and I, I think the disruptive questioning may have something to do with that. So I was sympathetic about it, but uh, ultimately uh, I think the speakers could have done a slightly better job of balancing the time they had uh, in terms of um, paying attention to each issue. And, and then the final point I'll make is just a point I made at last year's uh, finals as well. Uh, I think you, you have to identify which arguments are your best arguments, uh, because not all arguments have the have the same weight in terms of uh, how compelling they are. Uh, and I think the skill of uh, a mooter, particularly at the final stages of a competition, is to really know how to prioritize and to use your time, uh, you know, intelligently in terms of getting your, your judges to sink their teeth into, into the most impressive and, and compelling of your arguments. Sometimes elements of your argument, uh, your overall argument can be slightly weaker than the others. And I, it, it's your skill to be able to, to navigate through that fast and get to the real uh, you know, strong points. And I think uh, we were impressed with how uh, the second respondent speaker actually did that. And that's part of the reason we, uh, we decided that he was the best oralist for the finals. I'll leave it to my colleagues to, to chip in as well. Thank you very much. My turn for a bit of a gender variety <laughs> in, the, in the feedback. First of all, congratulations uh, to all of you for having done such a marvelous job. Um, I also would like to say that I think the case study was really great. Uh, so uh, my compliments to, to, to uh, our presiding judge uh, and his team for, for putting this together. Um, everyone did an amazing job, obviously, and it's really hard actually to do this over Zoom. Um, so uh, extra compliments for that. Um, the applicant also had to deal with some connectivity issues and that was also dealt with very smoothly. So uh, bonus points for, for having weathered that uh, in, a, in, in a good way. So plus one to, to all the feedback that was just given, I just want to kind of like uh, reflect some of the things that I, I just noted down for, for you individually. Um, so uh, for the first uh, speaker, for the applicant, uh, Mr. Sariwala, um, uh, you came very, very close <laughs> to, to also kind of like being, I want to make a special mention, let me put it that way, for you as an oralist, uh, because uh, I think you did a really, really good job, um, particularly in uh, kind of like pivoting from responding to questions to going back to your arguments. Uh, I think you did that very deftly and uh, that, was, that was very well done. It was really clear that you had a really good grasp of, of what you wanted to say and managed to kind of connect responses to, you know, sometimes, you know, 
annoying questions, which is, you know, one of the fun jobs of being a judge. Uh, you get to ask annoying questions instead of having to answer them. Um, and yeah, you did that really well. And uh, I think that overall also you, you managed well that you ran out of time, but I agree that it's like interesting that every year I'm at the moot court, this is a consistent problem. So I do wonder like some teams need to kind of like uh, prepare for that just a little bit better, I think in advance. Um, then to your, your colleague, uh, Mr. Chatterjee, um, also, yeah, in spite of the, the, the slight technical issues that we had, um, I noted down that you had uh, really good responses to, to the questions. And I noted in particular that you had a good response to the question about like how to deal with the issue that we were talking about a private platform uh, and a public regulation and so on, which I thought was really, really well done. And it was good that you were ready for that. So uh, compliments for that. <laughs> and moving on to the, to the respondents, uh, Mr. Haynes. Um, I, great responses also to the questions. Um, and what I had in particularly noted here was that I thought you did something very clever at the end of your argument in which you kind of made a nice invitation toward to be the first to rule on this important matter, which is a, a trick I tried <laughs> myself many times as well, whenever litigating something for, for a first time before a court or a tribunal. And uh, I think it's always good to kind of like, you know, play a little bit to the vanity of the court in, in being a pioneer. So that was very strategic uh, of you. And then uh, Mr. Jennings, uh, excellent uh, response uh, to the questions. Um, I have here written down that you were cool and collected. <laughs> so uh, you were very stable, you were very calm, uh, in spite of the fact that we were throwing uh, lots of questions at you, which in the end, you know, also is on the side of the, of the least sympathetic side, uh, always of the, of the case, right? I mean, as the respondent, <laughs> uh, you are not uh, on the side of freedom of expression and, and that is not easy. Uh, and in spite of that, uh, you, you made a really good argument and also uh, elegantly disagreed uh, with the judges from time to time, which uh, yeah, was really well done. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would say I really enjoyed uh, listening to you. Uh, you were mellifluous, you were honeyed and flowing, you were silver tongued. Uh, I would happily retain any one of you uh, to represent me. So, you know, really well done. Um, uh, going to first to uh, A1, I thought that you set out at the beginning the conjunctive nature of the test really well, uh, and you made a very clear and articulate argument. Um, one of the things that you might want to think about going forward is, um, I wouldn't ask to continue with your uh, submissions. I would have the confidence because you're really very good. I would have the confidence just to go on. Um, you did a very good citation uh, to the record. Um, and I think one of the things that you did was you had a bit of problems with the time. And as uh, Judge uh, Jansen has said, that is a problem every year. And one of the tricks that I have seen only once is people having the citations to their memorial. So one of the things you can do if you realize you're running out of time is to reference to the memorial which paragraphs you want us to read separately. And that gives you sort of, if you like, uh, a record of having made that argument um, I thought that uh, your rebuttal was really good. I like the crisp four points. Uh, I think they could have been crisper. And uh, for both of uh, you on the applicant side, I think it would have been interesting if you had come up with examples of what was uh, a less restrictive approach, because I think that would have given the judges something more to cling on to. Uh, and I think it also makes it more difficult uh, for the respondent. Um, uh, for Mr. Chatterjee, I, I, I did feel a bit about I was being read to. Um, you know, I, I, we all do this, so it's not really a pejorative comment. I mean, the first time I was in the House of Lords, Lord Bridge said to me uh, in the Brind case, are you reading to me, Mr. Stevens? Because if you are, I was educated with reading in mind and I'm happy to have the clerk photocopy your notes and read them to myself, um, which was probably the best put down anyone ever gave me. Um, 
but uh, you know, it's one of those things. It comes with confidence, and you know, sometimes uh, extemporizing a bit uh, does help. And clinging to notes, and this is sort of applicable to everybody. The more you stick to your notes, the worse it's going to be on time uh, because you feel you've got to get these things out. So I would just say that. I, I thought you made a great citation to paragraph 27. Uh, and I thought that that worked I incredibly well. Um, moving on to the respondent, uh, Mr. Haynes, you were so clear at the top of your opening. It was absolutely a delight to have that roadmap set out for us. It was really clear. You made a good citation to the memorial as well. Um, you. Um, you know, on the proportionality point, you then said, you know, does that answer your question? And, you know, moving on. Um, uh, I think, again, uh, I think you probably were a little too uh, focused on the comfort blanket of notes. Uh, and as I say, we all do that. So, you know, uh, just think about how, how you might do that. Um, uh, I thought your summary at the end was also excellent. Uh, I think that gave a, a big finish to your section, which I, I, I really appreciated. And, and, and as an oralist, it comes over well. So uh, really well done for that. Um, Mr. Jennings, um, you again gave a good roadmap uh, at the beginning. You gave us some positive reasons to find for you, which I think is really important because at the beginning, you're sort of setting us up so that we've got to think about the points you're making. Uh, I thought you made an excellent shift uh, to the presiding judge's uh, area of interest on the online side of things uh, and the restrictions online as opposed to just in the physical connectability. Um, I thought that uh, your citation to the Armenian case was good and I noticed you came back to that a couple of times uh, and I liked the citation to Professor David Kay's uh, report. The problem you've got, of course, is that all three judges have read it, if not contributed to it. Uh, so we probably have a, a wider context than that. Um, I think um, one of the things that I felt was missing, and I think it was probably because of time, was a kind of big finish, a kind of quick summary at the end. Why should we find it for you? Um, I thought that your rebuttal uh, was, was good. Uh, again, I felt it could be a little bit of, it could have been a little bit crisper, but I recognize that from a respondent's point of view, um, it's, it's very difficult to load the gun with bullets when the other side are the ones actually doing the firing. So overall, I'm really impressed, incredibly well done, and your dedication and preparation, all of you came through, shining through like a beacon. Thank you. So thank you, Mark, for this. And uh, since we are done with the finals, I also want to congratulate to Team 201 for winning this international rounds. I also want to congratulate to Team 104 for being a runner-up. And at the very end, I really want to uh, thank our judges, our final band judges. Um, I suppose most of you noticed that uh, Judge Gohan is the one who wrote the case this year. So we were really pleased to have him here today with us. And uh, also to thank Nani and Mark for supporting our mood court for years now, for always being available for, for us and uh, for taking the time out of their busy schedules just to spend time with you and us and to share these wonderful comments. It's a quite, uh, quite of delight for us and um, I won't keep you any longer. We would like to see you all at 4.30 for our award ceremony. We are very well aware that some of you, for some of you, it's going to be quite late, but maybe you can have it as a Friday party ceremony together with us. So we will be there. Um, we Nevena, sorry to interrupt, but the judges are not aware of where the teams came from. I don't think. Oh. Yeah, that is one of one of the other things that we should mention. Yeah, so the winners as applicants are National Law School of India, Bangalore, and the runner-ups is uh, City University of London. 
So that is the last thing, yeah, that we haven't mentioned. Thank you, Sarah. So as said, we will be here at 4.30 uh, to three and a half hours from now, waiting for you. As you all know, we have different awards. We will announce also top 10 teams for international rounds and uh, we'll be happy to see you and talk to you again. Once again, thank everybody for being here and um, looking forward to seeing you in person only next year. Can I ask, will it be on this link? That the no, we have a different link. I also send you, uh, so you have it in the agenda. I can also send it via email once more for everybody. Well, thank you very much and um, see you see you later then. See you soon. Thank you and congratulations Team 205. Yes, congratulations. Thank you to the team for everything you've done. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So I'm going to stop the video. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all, depending on where you are currently. Um, welcome, my name is Sabol Zodriti, and I have the honor to be, well, let's say the host of this Zoom meeting, or at least the co-host. And I would like to congratulate all of you, not just for making this award ceremony, but for all of your efforts so far in this competition. I'll just have to admit someone in the meantime. and. Uh, what we will do right now is have a little award ceremony. I hope you are all ready for it. And uh, we will go through uh, like a good roadmap on what we're supposed to do. So first of all, um, I, we have here uh, Kate Oregon, the director of Bonavero Institute of Human Rights, who will say a couple of words. And then I will give the floor to Mr. Monroe Price to continue on their reflections on how the mood went. And then uh, I'll give the floor to the super organizing team composed of Sarah, Nevana, Sanya, and Camille that you are now very familiar. Um, then comes the fun part of the awards that I will be presenting. And hopefully you can't wait to start. So let's do that. And I will give now the floor to Kate. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Sabot, and hello to everybody. And congratulations to you all for the participation in the moot. We are, needless to say, very sad that we're not all in Oxford as we're speaking uh, and having an award ceremony in person. But it certainly is wonderful that we have been able to host the moot online uh, across a whole range of reg regions um, and now in this final week, week virtually in Oxford. This moot could not work without all of you and without the wonderful people who organize the regional rounds um, and who coach the teams. And so I want to say a big thanks to everybody who works for the moot, who's not actually a mooter. I know many of you have been mooters in your previous life, but the fact that you go on being committed to the moot and, you know, Navena, Camille and Sanya are classic examples of that, that you go on being committed to the moot just shows how much you ex value the experiences mooters in your earlier lives and how you want to share that going forward. I also want to say that I still really believe that this moot on the topic of freedom of expression is probably one of the most important moots in the world at the moment, in the sense that 
we all know that we live in societies in which freedom of expression is always under threat. We can never give up and think that we have won freedom of expression no matter where we live. So participating in this moot gives you the tools to think about how important freedom of expression and some of its related rights like association um, are and how it gives you the tools to think about how to protect that through the tools of international human rights law. So that is one of the reasons why the Bonavere Institute for Human Rights is very committed to the moot is the importance of the subject matter. And the last thing I want to say is that I think the other really wonderful thing about this moot is the unbelievable sense of fun that the organizing team bring to it. All through the year, they, they really uh, work very hard to make the mood work, but they do enjoy it as well. And I think if you can do something really successfully and enjoy it, it's a great recipe for success and a great recipe for life. So my congratulations to the wonderful organizing team once again for all their great work. I love working with them and I'm sure all of you have enjoyed your interactions with them. So with that, I'm going to hand over to our um, wonderful Munro Price, after whom the moot is uh, named, and um, for him to give you a few words on his reflection of his many years uh, of association with the moot. Munro. Thank you very much, Kate. First of all, it's a pleasure to be associated with Kate O'Regan and the Bonavera Institute for Human Rights. It's been wonderful for the moot court. It's sustained it. It's strengthened it. It's given it. It sustained its spirit. I also would say it's been interesting this year, of course, has been an amazing year in terms of the mood, in terms of the conditions under which it's been conducted and the, the brilliance with which the staff and, and the participants have handled all of the challenges that have occurred. But I also would remark about how much the context of freedom of expression has changed over the years. And we, we, we the period of uh, social media uh, and now the, the period of public health, all, all these tremendous issues of technology, of context, of demography, uh, which are reflected every year in the mood. And it's, the thing I think is thrilling about the mood, it's a kind of global debate society in different contexts, in different societies, each group, each area coming to grips with uh, problems of uh, freedom of expression. And the mood has gone out of its way to engage with students from all over the world who face particular challenges with freedom of expression. So it's been thrilling to see the finals today, to see all the wonderful faces, to see all, uh, one of the great things about Zoom is the gallery view. So the idea that you can see in a gallery view, a kind of synopsis of freedom of expression in the world is a thrilling thing in itself. So thank you very much and congratulations to you all. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, I see many new participants have joined as well. So uh, I'm just gonna say I'm Sabal Zodritim to whoever wasn't here and we're doing the award ceremony, which is about to continue. But before that, uh, now that many of us are here, I would like to ask everyone to turn on their videos just for a second, speaking of the gallery view available in Zoom and unmute yourself and do a little hi or cheers just to make sure that we can hear you, that you're around, express yourself and give everyone a round of applause because I think we all deserve it after this long week. So please do so, uh, open up your mic, your video and make sure that we can all hear you. Hey. Let us do three, two, one. Congratulations. Bravo. Well done. Okay. After this little group exercise, I think we shall go back now to our fantastic organizational team who will brief you on all the rest that is needed to know in the world. No. I give the floor now to Sarah first. Sarah. Thank you, Sabots. Um, I just wanted to say another huge thank you to our very wonderful judges who've joined us this year. Um, one of the very few silver linings to this whole thing being online rather than in person is that many, many judges who might not have otherwise been able to join us have been able to join us. So we've had 
a record number of judges, I think 132 in total, and Camille will be able to nod and confirm that. But that's a record and we've had some amazing judging going on and some wonderful people who've given up their time for us and we're really grateful for that. Um, I also wanted to say a huge thank you to the fantastic final bench um, this morning that was made up of uh, Nani Yats and Ravent Lowe and Mark Stevens and Gehan Gunatilek, who were wonderful and asked many, many questions and really uh, kept the teams on their toes. Uh, and it was a great, it was a great final. I, I have to confess at this point in time, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know nothing about the law, but it was fantastic. Um, so we want to really thank them for that. It was wonderful. Um, and uh, I'm just hoping that we can see all the judges and all of you, of course, but all our judges in person next year. And let's hope we still get 132 judges next year. That would be wonderful. And I'll hand back to Sabolts now. Thank you very much. Now I open up the floor to Nevana, who's going to talk a bit about the regional coordinator's role and the structure of how everything is organized. Nevana, please. Thank you, Sabolts. Uh, I want to use this opportunity to thank all of our regional coordinators. Um, you all know that we had eight regional rounds this year and you all participated in one of those. And uh, I wa want to call each one of those and our coordinators with a special thanks for keeping this mood alive, for volunteering their time to organizing and especially for doing the whole switch from in-person rounds to online rounds and for making it work very well. So for we had first Southeast Europe rounds and uh, Sabo Zoldretti, who is here with us today, was the one to break the ice uh, and help us all uh, to have the really good rounds in terms of technical stuff. And as well, Gergeli Gostoni, who is the coach of uh, Eltwash University, but as well, without him, we couldn't make it happen all these years. Um, as for the North Europe rounds, we had coordinators Alina Pravdichenko and Maxim Dordvoi. So thanks to them. And we had a wonderful round as well. Uh, Asia Pacific rounds, Shupei is our coordinator for the last couple of years. So we thank her as well. Uh, America's rounds, Vincent Capel, Regan Sampson, and Natalie Ramirez have run it. Uh, South Asia rounds, Sarjit Singh and Teashvita Karel have been doing it for the last couple of years with a great success. Northern Europe rounds, this was the second year, and without Professor Caroline Legofik and Ziad Lufti, we couldn't make it happen. Uh, Middle East rounds, Professor Ahmed Khalifa and Ola Nagy are doing that also for years and very successful. And we had Africa rounds as well that we ran this year, but hopefully next year we will be back in person in Africa. So a huge thanks for all of our regional coordinators. Well, I'm happy to say as a regional coordinator, it's really nice. So almost crying. No. Uh, and now I would like to ask Sanya to continue along these lines, please. Thank you, Shabot. Um, so I have the exciting task of thanking our memo markers. And memo markers are often uh, unglorified. They have like quite difficult work of really grappling with these arguments that teams have spent so many months crafting and assigning a score to each of these arguments. And I must say they've done a fantastic job. Um, so I'd like to thank all of the regional memo markers as well as the international memo markers who had several memorials to mark but did it without a single complaint. Petr Radosabiev, Chani Srivastava and Rafael Pangalangan. Rafael also did a mooting masterclass for us. So in the event that any of the teams here had attended that you recognize him from there. And Petar and Chani have judged both the regional and international rounds as well. Um, I must also thank Kehan Gunatileke, specifically not just for judging the finals, as Sarah pointed out, but also for drafting the competition case itself. And it's not that's not an easy task as well, trying to find balance in the case and trying to have make sure that everyone's happy and that all sides have something to argue. So thank you very much. 
for fantastic case, Kehan. Um, I'd also like to thank our regional round judges who took a lot of time out of their schedule to judge several preliminary rounds, some of whom also judged the international rounds, for which we are also very grateful. Uh, and finally, also to the Bonavero Institute, because uh, they really enabled us um, to bring a wide range of events around the moot to the price moot community, which is something we would never have been able to do outside, of course, of the circumstances we find ourselves in. Uh, so thanks to everyone. Saboj, back to you. Thank you very much. And now finally, Camille is going to name all the stars of the competition itself, who without nothing would have been possible, namely the teams. So be prepared for a long list. Go. Thanks so much, Savo. So as was mentioned, I get the privilege of thanking the teams, all of you who participated and made this happen. So the past year has been very challenging in many respects. You know, from an organizational perspective, definitely challenging. We've been very privileged to have eight successful regional rounds, as Nevena previously mentioned, with about 100 teams participating. So the 30 teams that qualify to the international round represent the very best of their regions. And we are quite privileged to, to have had you. But not only were things challenging on a organizational level, they were also challenging on a personal level for very many of us. And we know that this is true for, for the teams as well and for the members of, of teams. During this process, we've had stories that have been shared with us about you know, various challenges, teams not being able to meet in person to practice at all. Some teams, team members, you know, were ill themselves and others lost loved ones. And you know, those are very tragic and challenging circumstances to work through, but we want to congratulate all of you, all the teams for working so hard and pushing through the challenges. So with that being said, it gives me immense pleasure to formally um, congratulate and identify all 30 of our qualifying teams. So please do bear with me. Everyone will have their names in light. So first of all, from the Northern Europe Regional Round, Team 101, Humboldt University of Berlin, Germany. Team 104, City University of London, UK. Team 105, University of Luxembourg, Luxembourg. Team 108, Law Society of Ireland. And now from our South Asia Regional Rounds. Team 205, National Law School of India, University, Bangalore, India. Team 213, Symbiosis Law School, Pune, India. Team 225, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. And from our Southeast Europe round, Team 301 at Vosloran University Faculty of Law, Hungary. Team 303, University of Bucharest Faculty of Law, Romania. Team 304, National and Kabbalistrian University of Athens, Greece. And Team 505, Team 305, sorry, University of Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina. From the Americas Regional Round, Team 401, Brooklyn Law School, USA. Team 405, Osgood Hall Law School, York University, Canada. Team 407, University of Pennsylvania Law School, USA. And Team 409, Georgetown University Law Center, USA. From our Middle East Regional Round, Team 502, Erzit University, Palestine. Team 503, Ayn Shams University, Egypt. Team 505, Holy Spirit University of Catholic, Lebanon. And Team 507, University of Tehran, Iran. From our Northeast Europe round, Team 601, University of Latvia. Team 603, National University of Kyiv Mohila Academy, Ukraine. 
from our Asia Pacific round. Team 701, Singapore Management University, Singapore. Team 703, University of International Business and Economics, China. Team 704, National University of Singapore. And Team 707, University of Philippines, Dilemon, Philippines. And finally, from our Africa Regional Round, Team 802, Cavendish University, Uganda. Team 804, University of Pretoria, South Africa. Team 806, University of Malaya, Malaysia, which is not in Africa, but participated in the Africa Regional Round. Team 808, University of Witzwatron, South Africa. And finally, but of course not least, Team 812, Bowen University, Osun State, Nigeria. So thank you so very much to all the participating teams. We really appreciate all the efforts that you made this year to make our virtual rounds quite successful. And we look forward to seeing you all participating, hopefully in person next year. Thank you. Back to you, Sabo. Thank you, Camille. I hope everyone was paying attention because here comes the Surrey battle when you have to mention all of the teams again. So be prepared. No, here comes the fun part where the awards ceremony will continue with the actual awards itself. We have quite a few, which include the winner and runner up for the final with the best oralist in the finals, the memorials, which include the best memorial run up and the best memorial itself, the top oralist, which includes 10 people. Uh, so bear with me in the preliminary rounds and the top 10 teams in the preliminary rounds itself. And finally concluding with the spirit of the competition award with Mr. Jonathan Blake himself, who will say a couple of words regarding that. So let's go back to the beginning, uh, which is the final. I haven't had the chance to participate and uh, look into this year's final, but I've heard that it has been a stellar uh, match. So that was between team 205 and team 104, if I'm not mistaken, which is the National Law School of India University Bangalore and City University of London, and has ended up with giving out the prizes, just so you know. Uh, the runner-up team 104 City University of London and the winners 205 National Law School of India University Bangalore. So give them a little round of applause. Don't be shy to push those emoji reactions as well. Uh, regarding the best oralist in the finals, uh, I have seen you joined as well. Uh, so congratulations to Rafa Jennings from the City University of London for this amazing achievement. Um, continuing with the memorials, which I believe hasn't been announced yet. So now I know you're on your toes to hear. It includes the best memorial run-up, which goes out to team 213, Symbiosis Law School, Pune, India. And the best memorial, 806, University of Malaya, Malaysia, which we have heard is not in Africa. If you didn't catch the names or you have some doubts, then don't worry, everything will be published later on online. Uh, so just try to enjoy it with me. Uh, the top oralist category in the preliminary rounds, which included 99 speakers. So it was a really hard job to seize it down to the best 10. Uh, and here is the part where unfortunately I am going to butcher uh, your names because I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce them correctly, but I'm apologizing for that in advance. So uh, the 10th, Top Oralist in Preliminary Round Awards goes to Alosius Francis M. Bresnan from the University of Philippines, Diliman. Congratulations. Ninth place goes to Diana Kumiski, University of Pennsylvania Law School. Eighth place goes to Aman Shadivali from University, wait, National Law School of India University. My mistake. Seventh place goes to Louis Lau Yi Hang, Singapore Management University. Six is Nitya Patalam 
University of Pennsylvania Law School. Fifth is Charlie Richardson, City University of London. Fourth is Victoria Liu Xin Air, Singapore Management University. And now we're going to the top three, which is third place goes to Connor Ford Law Society of Ireland. Best oralist runner-up, Laura Dune Law Society of Ireland. And finally, I have the honor and the privilege to announce that the top oralist in the preliminary rounds for this year's moot has been best oralist Maria Jose Escobar from University of Bucharest Faculty of Law. Congratulations to all of you. I hope you are cheering and clapping as well. Unfortunately, I cannot see everyone, but in my heart, I believe everyone's now doing this. So now continuing further down to the top 10 teams in the preliminary rounds, uh, just for your information, as Nevena has said, there have been eight regional rounds this year with a total of 100 teams. So now here we have 30 teams. I hope you can do the maths of what great achievement you have accomplished so far. Um, here we go. 10th goes to team 105, University of Luxembourg. Ninth place goes to 108, Law Society of Ireland. Eighth place goes to 601, the University of Latvia. Seventh place goes to 701, Singapore Management University. Sixth place goes to 101, Humboldt University of Berlin. Fifth place goes to 407, University of Pennsylvania Law School. Fourth goes to 213, Symbiosis Law School, Puny. Third place goes to 205, National Law School of India, University of Bangalore. Second is 806, University of Malaya. And the first top team within the preliminary rounds was City, University of London, Team 104. Congratulations to all of you. I see Sanya is putting them all in the chat. So in case you've missed something, you can always check there or rewatch the recording once it's done. So I'll have to catch my breath for a while. So now I have the honor and privilege for our last award, which is the Spirit of the Competition Award to give the floor to Mr. Jonathan Blake, who will say a couple of words regarding that. I am happy to say and share a personal anecdote that he has been a judge when I was a mooter for me. It has been a really nice memory. And then later on, I had the uh, great opportunity to be a judge with him, which is one of the most treasured memories of me uh, from the Price Media Most Loot Court. So if you're here, Mr. Blake, I would like to give now the floor to you. Mr. Blake, please do unmute yourself first. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. <laughs> Never know, uh, told me that I was unmooted. And so here I go. Um, I, 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 that was a really nice introduction and I really uh, brought back great memories. And it shows you the co continuity of this uh, great organization and uh, experience that we all have. Um, I am so proud to be associated with the Moots and I am so proud to be associated with the Spirit of Competition Award. Many groups contribute to the Spirit of the Competition, both here and in the regional rounds. Judges, coaches, donors, a world-class organizers, and I want to diverge to mention that uh, three uh, last year, uh, with about three weeks' notice, or maybe a little more than that, this was converted it from a live event to a, a, a digital event, a remote event. And it was an extraordinary accomplishment. And perhaps one of the greatest tributes 
is other moots contacted this team to figure out how they did it. <laughs> and uh, I can see Kate smiling and she knows that there's a secret sauce here, which is the people involved. Uh, but none contribute more than you, our student participants. Um, the other contributors that make this moot court work so successfully is because of the or enormous efforts the student participants put into this. Um, it is gratifying to help you develop your skills. And it is encouraging and impressive uh, your obvious concerns about the issues that we uh, that the the competition addresses among as Kate said among the most important of our time and sadly probably continuing for forever because these things are not permanent um, let me support uh, these points by uh, quoting from uh, an email that Monroe received exactly a week ago from somebody who, is, who, who did very well, as it turns out, I just heard, learned. Um, she said, I am passionate about everything that has to do with communication and its lawful limits. Um, I, I did not hesitate to apply despite the, the situation with the pandemic and the knowledge that it would be unlikely that I would be able to travel to Oxford, the intellectual home of so many of my personal heroes. heroes. Um, working on the memorials was such a thrilling and fascinating experience. Um, I enjoyed familiarizing myself with the tricky aspects of the duty of states to ensure the free flow of information in times of crisis, while also keeping the amplifying effect of the internet under control, which I'd love to hear more of those secrets. <laughs> uh, uh, I, like, I would like to think that knowing the reach of both articles of the ICCPR protecting speech and assembly has not only made me a better jurist, but also a more responsible citizen. I really think um, that you can't go, can't do better than that summary of the experience. And I thank her for writing Monroe. Um, the moot, the Monroe Price moot courts stretching back in time as well as around the world has, is a strong community as demonstrated by how it has weathered and even strengthened over these two years and by the vigor and the quality of your performances over the course of not just this past week, but goes back for months, I know, and regional rounds as well. Um, but I could not be more grateful and impressed about how you have contributed to the spirit of the competition in 2021 and beyond. When I first uh, judged a price moot court, I think it was in India about eight years ago, I was so impressed by the role of the coaches. And they are the winners of the Spirit of Competition Award this year. Um, and I, I am absolutely thrilled that these suggestions came from the beneficiaries of the efforts that coaches put into this. Um, but I remember the guidance 
and the bonds and the closeness. And when they were traveling, you know, it was more than just teaching them how to present, but uh, escorting them around a, a different community, a different city, and introducing them to other people. It was really inspiring. And, and, I, and I love that. And I love seeing coaches come back over and over and over again, because it means so much to them. Um, I remember Nevena's coach, for example, who was a great fellow and took us out to a pub uh, owned by a Serbian in uh, Oxford. Um, uh, I, I was I was also particularly impressed by how the, the 360 degrees of their responsibilities, helping students with stress, teaching them, bringing them along, giving them confidence, consoling them when you, you were disappointed. It's just a huge role and it's all encompassing and they're very deserving of the award today. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you for those kind words, Mr. Blake. I was just muted for a second, but I guess everyone is now used to the phenomenon of forgetting to unmute or mute yourself. Yeah. So uh, indeed, the spirit of the award goes to the coaches for all their work. I've heard that there were teams who weren't able to meet physically and they could only do it digitally. So that is a great effort from their side, which is remarkable. And that they managed to get here during all this year of hard work and effort. Uh, so with all those, I believe there are no more awards to give out, unfortunately. So I hope that all of you uh, had a great time, not only during this award ceremony, even though I haven't seen any pajamas or cat filters going on during the Zoom session, but I do hope that uh, everyone has now a great memory of this competition and will be back hopefully next year in a more physical presence as well. And even though we might not be together physically in Oxford, in the King's Arms, for example, we can still be hopefully in each other's arm soon. So with that, I now would like to conclude the 14th international round of this Price Media Low Mood Court. Um, as we did before, I just want to say, uh, please unmute yourself once again, put your video and uh, we can do a big virtual hug and uh, saying goodbye. Oh, and just before that, the award certificates itself and the certifications of participation and everything else will be shared with you during the next week in a Dropbox folder and you will receive some follow-up emails from the brilliant organization. So thank you once again to everyone who participated uh, during the week. I hope you had fun and memories which will last forever and now you won't be able to forget Joke Sana and the efforts of uh, what it truly means to fight for the freedom of expression. So thank you once again and goodbye. Good luck to all of you and see you hopefully. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. Exactly. Congratulations to all. Thank mm -hmm. you.